Okay, folks, well, this is a little bit of a working vacation, and uh, I'm going to be doing a little bit of commentary for the capstone class. Sorry I don't have a blackboard. Um, if you can see behind me at all, uh, this is a condo association that we uh, live in when we're down in uh, Tennessee, and... Um, we uh, own a condo here and we have a nice pool out here and a hot tub and then uh, uh, behind me is a beautiful view of the mountains. I don't know how much of it you can see but uh, uh, that's not really our purpose for being here today is it? So let's uh, uh, just kind of comb through these slides uh, on the PowerPoint and talk a little bit about contract law. Now you know you should have had 107 uh, as a required course in your program. I'm, I'm hoping that that is true so that this will just be kind of a review for you. I want you to remember that there's uh, several different types of contracts. There's a unilateral or bilateral, which unilateral would be one person, or bilateral would be two, so it would be uh, people back and forth together. Uh, there's express contracts, which can be oral or written, or there are implied contracts. Uh, in other words, a contract can be more or less enforced by the courts on someone uh, because of their actions. Uh, or there are also quasi-contracts. Contracts can be void, voidable, or unenforceable. Uh, they can be executory or executed. Uh, they can be valid, enforceable contracts, which require mutual assent, uh, consideration, and absence of defenses. Uh, and so, uh, basically, if both parties live up to their part of the contract, then you should have a completed contract. Uh, one of the things that's usually required to form a contract is an offer, O-F-F-E-R, offer, and this must be definite and certain. It requires the parties to uh, understand, communicate, uh, so that both parties clearly understand what the terms are uh, of the contract. Uh, and so the offer or has to communicate the offer to the offeree and it has to have a definite subject matter and it does not necessarily include statements made in jest or anger uh, you know if you don't do this I'm gonna kill you you know uh, if you don't let me marry your daughter I'm gonna kill you okay that's not a contract okay it's not an offer uh, advertisements are not offers, okay? That's something we've learned over the years. Advertisements uh, can be anything from puffing to informational uh, and just maybe an appeal to a person to just take a look, but it doesn't constitute an offer. Auctions are not offers uh, to form a contract. Um, invitations to make an offer are not offers. In other words, even though someone may say, well, make me an offer, that doesn't mean that you're, there's any way anybody is required or uh, compelled to do anything further. It's just an invitation. Uh, terminations uh, of, the, of the offer have to be communicated uh, and they have to be revocable. And so um, this revocation has to be received by the offeree. Remember offeree, person receiving offer, offeror, person making offer, okay? Limitations on uh, revocation. Uh, this could be an option contracts. Uh, this could be a UCC type situation, which is Uniform Commercial Code. Uh, or this can be a form of detrimental reliance. So in other words, uh, someone says uh, with apparent authority, uh, you paved my driveway and uh, we'll pay you $8,000. So the party goes on vacation, the guy comes in, 
uh, does the entire job, finishes up, very nice, well done. Guy comes back and says, well, I was just talking. I, I didn't really mean that as an offer. I just uh, meant it as a suggestion, and it wasn't in writing. So therefore, because of the statute of frauds, it is no uh, contract. But that's where they would enforce an implied contract, because the guy obviously went out to his detriment, bought materials, did a lot of work, uh, engaged equipment, you know, all the things that he had to do to uh, finish that driveway. So he was entitled, you know, to be paid because the work was done uh, on the strength of the reliance to his detriment on the comments by the other person uh, that could be interpreted as an offer. Uh, partial performance of a unilateral contract. So in other words, uh, a person uh, is discussing uh, the terms of a unilateral contract and he set, starts to set out to perform that contract. Uh, and here again, very similar to the detrimental reliance uh, standard. Uh, so he gets to complete the performance and basically he's compelled to complete the performance on both sides. Uh, rejects, rejection can be uh, you know, an oral rejection it can be a lapse of time, nothing said over time, means, uh, you know, ipso facto, it is a rejection because he didn't accept it. Operation of law, uh, there may be a written standard in different states regarding the rejection. In other words, you have to follow the terms that are set forth for rejection by your state. Uh, acceptance, there are common law rules uh, there are also UCC rules, which remember, uniform uh, commerce clause, uh, and that is something that's a model act that was adopted by all the states. So every state follows the UCC. Uh, UCC requires consistent terms, uh, and if there are inconsistent terms, then uh, they are subject to interpretation. Uh, and so section 2, 207 of the UCC, you can just type in Google UCC 2, 207, and you can look at this fully uh, and basically understand, uh, you know, avoiding the effects of inconsistent terms. Uh, communication of acceptance, um, basically if a, an acceptance is put in the mailbox by first class mail, not certified mail, but first class mail, then it's deemed accepted. So uh, if someone has a problem with their mail or whatever, as rare as it is in the United States, the general rule is that um, if a person can, can prove, yeah, I mailed that on such such date, um, generally speaking, the other person is bound by the acceptance of the offer. Uh, basic crossing offers, so in other words, a person puts out an offer, Another person puts out a counter offer. First one accepts the first offer. The other person has already basically said, well, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. I want to use this counter uh, offer, a different offer than the first offer. Uh, and so, um, you know, these are other problems that can crop up. A uh, waiver of acceptance can be uh, set forth uh, in an express waiver. Uh, or in some cases, uh, unlike the one that we talked about a minute ago, <coughs> excuse me, silence can be deemed as acceptance. So if it basically it's written in the offer that silence is considered acceptance, then that could be a problem for a person because in that kind of case they need to com communicate the rejection. Remember that consideration is a requirement in most contracts, and this consideration is a bargain. So in other words, each side has duties in this contract. And so the consideration is um, one of the things that a person is making a promise for a promise. Uh, there needs to be legal value in that consideration. Um, basically, um, this consideration. Uh, there can be honest disputes as to any duty arising. 
Um, but look again at your UCC for exceptions. Uh, payment of existing debts, for example. Uh, since you already owe the person, how can that be consideration for something new? Another one is forbearance to sue. You have the right to sue. You choose not to sue. Well, that cannot necessarily be consideration because you can either choose to sue or not to sue. Uh, mutuality of consideration. In other words, has to have value to both sides. So in other words, one person is giving something in exchange for the promise from the other person. Uh, basically, uh, a promise nowadays can in be have substitutes for consideration which could be uh, notarized. Uh, any kind of a writing, it, in some cases, can be a substitute for consideration. Um, sometimes, the, let us say that you've renewed something that the time has expired. So in other words, if you'll do this for me, I'll pay you that bill that I should have paid you before, but because the time to collect has passed, then um, you know, basically, you've renewed that debt, so that can be a form of consideration. So that's a little bit different than saying, well, I'm just paying you something I owe you anyway. Uh, it's a little bit different because the time to pay has expired. Uh, there are defenses to contracts. Uh, important one is the minority exception, which is lack of capacity. Uh, let's say a young man that's uh, 15 years old goes out and tells somebody he's 19 and buys a car. Uh, they didn't get a driver's license or any kind of proof of age. So the person goes and wrecks that car. Does that young man owe for that car? Answer is generally speaking no. Because it was on the seller to assure that that person had the capacity to buy that car. That's where you need proof of identity, and that's where like a driver's license or something like that as your date of birth can come up more and more. Uh, mental incapacity. Let's say that a guy is subject to a guardianship, and he doesn't have uh, the ability to spend any money without permission of his guardian. And so he goes out and rents a limousine and just wants a joyride around town, and his problem is he's a chronic alcoholic, so he gets a, a bill for this big limousine that he drove all around town uh, and uh, basically the, wants the guardian to go ahead and pay it. Well, it puts the guardian in a bind, I mean, because he wants to have a good relationship with the businesses in the community, but on the other hand, the guy doesn't really have the capacity to get involved in these things. And his problem is the reason he has a guardian is he blows money on drinking and partying and riding around in a limousine. So uh, that can be uh, a real problem. Uh, there can also be duress where someone says, you know, you either uh, have my family, pave your drive, and this has actually happened to me. Elderly couple, you know, you have my company, pave your driveway today. You go to the bank, get the money, pay my crew, to pave your driveway or there's going to be damage to your house. You know, they actually threaten people that if you don't hire us to pave the driveway, then, uh, you know, you're going to have something bad's going to happen uh, in your family, uh, to your home. So um, this ended up being a lawsuit. Uh, today in Indiana, for example, there are... Uh, if you, if you do uh, threaten the elderly in that kind of a way, you're subject to travel damages plus attorney fees, and this can be a very bad uh, outcome for a person in that type of situation. Um, so uh, other forms of uh, lack of consent in defenses include uh, undue influence, uh, can be less uh, dangerous, let's say, as the duress one, but uh, you hang around the people. There was a guy down in Texas, for example, his name was Scoggins, you know, and he got around these old people, did all kind of nice things, and then they wrote him into the will, was what he was hoping. Uh, so there's just things like that that can be done, especially with the elderly, 
um, that can be very bad uh, in terms of uh, locking them in to require them to do something that they really don't want to do. Other things are misrepresentation. Someone says, oh, that roof uh, never leaks in the house. Uh, you, we want you to go ahead and buy the house, but well, what about that stain on the ceiling? If the roof doesn't leak, why is there this stain on the ceiling? You know, oh, well, that was the bathtub overflowed, and we, we got that fixed, so that should be taken care of, and we'll paint over that stain, and no sooner than the guy gets the house than it's, the roof's leaking like a sieve right through that spot. Uh, it wasn't a bathtub. It was the roof after all. So it's a form of uh, misrepresentation. It can even be fraud. Um, there can also be other defenses like mistakes, uh, you know, mutual, unilateral. Uh, they misunderstood what the terms were going to be of this contract. Uh, there's also issues of uh, illegality. In other words, trying to get somebody, uh, let's say, to buy marijuana or something. And you're trying to go to court and sue them and say, well, you still owe me for that marijuana. You know, well, how do you think that's going to work? Well, that's an illegal con contract, so it's not going to work. Uh, unconscion unconscionability. Uh, I see a lot of this with some of these used car dealers. It still goes on. If anything, it's worse than ever. I used to see a lot of, uh, you know, um, places. I'm trying to word this carefully, but uh, there's used car dealerships where you can get um, financing right at the dealership for a used car, well a lot of time the true value for that car, maybe let's say it's $2,500 and uh, so you pay like 250 down and then you pay every week like 90 bucks. Well, you know, the car, uh, maybe you, when it's all said and done, you will have end up paying these people $7,500 or three times the value of that automobile. So. Um, you know, that can be somewhat unconscionable. Uh, we've had cases where people have gotten these cars. It's funny, but some of them have left my hometown, these used car dealers, because they had so many bad stories about uh, junk cars that people bought that would lock up when they got them home. Uh, you know, the transmission locked up, the car wouldn't go, uh, and so this is what you call an unconscionable contract that the seller knew that this car had a lot of problems with it and the money that was being um, required to be paid was way in excess of the value but they were kind of preying on poor people that couldn't get any credit anywhere uh, just so they could get a car so there's uh, hidden uh, risk shifting provisions uh, or there's adhesion contracts where it's just the interest rate is so high the pricing is so high uh, that you're trying to take advantage. Well, I mentioned earlier the statute of frauds that can be uh, brought into play. It's usually promises for purchase of goods of more than $500, or it's really $500 or more have to be in writing. Well, like I said, there are some exceptions to that, <clears throat> uh, like those uh, situations of detrimental reliance, but uh, in most cases, anything over $500 uh, $500 or more, I keep saying that wrong, uh, have to be in writing. And this is uh, true of interest in land, uh, promises that cannot be performed within one year. Uh, it's also true of promise in consideration of marriage, uh, has to be in writing, okay? Promise uh, to answer for the debt of another. So in other words, you're going to co-sign for somebody. Well, you have to sign. That's the whole idea of co-sign is it has to be in writing. So if you promise to pay somebody's bills, that has to be in writing. Uh, also promises by an executor or administrator of an estate uh, that's going to pay money out of his own pocket. So in other words, let's say the executor's kind of embarrassed because something went wrong. Uh, well, you know, he can bring take it upon himself to make it right, but that has to be in writing. So I'm going to cover this once more because it's very important. Promises by executors to answer for debts uh, out of their own funds. Uh, promise to answer for the debt of another person. Once again, the old co-signer has to be in writing. Promises in consideration of marriage. In other words, I'll plow your field if you'll marry me. Sounds crazy, but stuff like that happened. 
in the past, like in the 19th century. Uh, has to be in writing. Uh, contracts for interest in land. In other words, you want to sell land to somebody, you want to deed that land to somebody, that has to always be in writing, okay? And it needs to be detailed. Uh, promises that require more than one year. In other words, you're going to build a bridge for somebody that's going to take two or three years, like the Brooklyn Bridge or something. That has to be in writing because it's going to take more than one year. And then last and probably most importantly, really purchase of goods for more than uh, $500. $500 or more. So anything $500 or more has to be in writing. There has to be some kind of a bill of sale if it's for cash. Uh, there has to be a security agreement if it's for some kind of a contract. So uh, whichever way you go on that, uh, you have to have... Um, everything in writing. Rights and duties of non-parties. This is also important. Third-party beneficiaries to contracts. It's very important uh, that you, um, you know, um, have a promisor, a promisee, and then there is a different beneficiary. So in other words, grandpa is going to buy a car for his grandson. Okay, that's, that's a, a, an issue. Uh, well, um, so in other words, it's really the deal is between promisee and promisor, but the car is going to be uh, put in the name of the grandson, okay? Uh, you can also assign rights. Uh, the obligor's duty will change if you assign your rights. So in other words, person that's going to sell an automobile, this is another way to do it by assignment. You can say, well, I was going to have you sell me that car, but instead I want you to title it in my grandson's name. So assignment of rights, another way to go on this. Sometimes assignments are prohib prohibited by law. Uh, here again, let's say that child's 15 years old, and you want to put that uh, vehicle in that uh, young man's name. might be problematic. Uh, also can be prohibited by contract. Um, now you get into some things here. Because back in the old days, matter of fact, uh, my mom and dad's house, I looked at their uh, title work. This was in the 1950s, and it was in Indiana. But it said, uh, uh, no blacks could own a home in this town unless they were uh, like a servant, like a butler or a basically manservant or a maid or something like that. No blacks could own. They couldn't even live in the house unless they were working in servitude. This was in like 1958 in Indiana of all places. Uh, well those would be unenforceable. You can't make those kind of contractual terms. Uh, and so that would be prohibited by law based on the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. Uh, and uh, so basically um, you know some things like that that you might see from time to time uh, are not going to be allowed. Uh, also assignments, you can assign different things, uh, wages. Uh, for example, a lot of guys nowadays, which is funny because they really resisted this in the beginning, but a lot of guys today will just go ahead and have their child support taken right out of their check so they don't forget to pay it. So, uh, you know, that can be an issue where you've got, it's kind of like a garnishment, but it's not a garnishment. It's similar, but it's not the same. It's an assignment, and that's different than a garnishment. And you can have an assignment, and you can have a garnishment both. I've had people say, well, you can't garnish my pay because uh, I am already have my child support taken out. Well, that doesn't work. Uh, you're going to actually end up with probably no paycheck because an assignment is not a garnishment. Very important. If you assign your pay to pay your child support, that does not protect you from garnishment. A lot of people uh, get that mixed up. Uh, rights and duties, again, uh, continued uh, delegation of duties. Uh, some duties can be subject to delegation, but what if it's an artist? You know, you know a certain artist and you want him to prepare a sculpture or a painting for you. And you, the guy says, well, I'm just too busy. I'm just too full up right now. Uh, and so basically I'm going to assign it to my young apprentice. Well, that's not going to work because they weren't hiring young apprentice. They're hiring Michelangelo. 
So some duties cannot be delegated like that. Uh, so very important that we make ourselves clear on that in the contract. Uh, if you leave it open that a person could delegate that to someone, uh, then that could cause you problems. Uh, rights and liabilities <clears throat> you know, of parties. Remember that there's an obligee and an obligor, which is a contractor, contractee. Um, and then you can have a person that delegates uh, certain um, responsibilities to another person, which would be the delegate. Construction and interpretation. Uh, basically, you want to first look at the overall or the whole of the contract, trying to make sure you understand the words. And, you know, you're basically trying to go with the most ordinary meaning of these words. Uh, there are also um, to be written or type provisions that have uh, basically control over printed ones. So in other words, if there's a conflict and there's a typed contract and someone has written stuff in the margin uh, and then it's not been the old uh, written part, type part, hasn't been marked out and initialed by both sides, then the type part will control. So just because somebody writes something in the margins or in between the lines, um, that's not going to control um, the actual um, type provisions that are typed in the contract are going to be more uh, responsible than something that you print in alongside with a pen uh, unless it's very clear that both sides agreed on those changes, marked out the old, an initial the new, and that's my initials, uh, you know, PRD would be my initials, okay? So if that's not on there, uh, both sides have to have their initials on there. Uh, then they have to make it clear so the next person that comes along can look, which is generally going to be a judge. So that's important to make sure your contract's clear. Uh, also, custom and usage. Uh, you can see that people do different things with different uh, contracts and communities and so forth so you can actually have witnesses testify as to what that usually means. Parole evidence is to try to be avoided as much as possible. Uh, if someone intended uh, for a written contract to be the full, complete, and final expression of their agreement, uh, then they cannot be changed by parole oral evidence uh, or in other words someone said, well, I wanted to change this or something like that, and he agreed to me uh, orally that he would agree to change it, but it's never been put in writing. Well, then you can't, you can't use that. You're going to have to go with the written form. Parole evidence uh, may be used in certain uh, situations when it comes to allegations of fraud, duress, mistake, clarifying ambiguities, uh, refuting a written recitation that there has been consideration when there was no consideration or sometimes subsequent uh, negotiations you know can come into play that there was intent to uh, amend that contract and that perhaps there is a written amendment out there but do, nobody can find it now I mean those are situations that can come up uh, and can be problematic Enforcement of contracts, we want to look at promise versus conditions. Uh, you've got to look at both sides, the promise and any conditions. Uh, you know, in other words, there can be hindrances, there can be breaches, someone didn't pay when they were supposed to pay, so the person stopped working, for example. Uh, or perhaps, let's say, the weather is bad, so that can be a problem. Uh, if you're building a house, for example, and you said, well, I'll get it built by such such date, uh, but it's not built by that date. Um, also look at waiver and estoppel. In other words, if the contract calls for certain uh, uh, actions within a certain number of days, so if you don't like this, you've got to let me know in 30 days, and it's 45 days, then you basically waived your right to complain. Uh, okay, performance. Remember illegality, um, basically, uh, you know, you're going to sell somebody drugs um, or let's say you're going to sell their children, something like that. You cannot 
engage in any kind of contract that involves illegality. Uh, sometimes these are pretty stark examples, but you can get into um, smaller examples like EPA violations, things like that, pollution, uh, things that you cannot do, violation of zoning laws. These can all be different forms of illegality. Uh, impossibility. Let's say somebody's supposed to paint your house in Florida and there's a sinkhole that comes up and that house you know disappears into a river down below and is washed away. Well it's impossible to paint that house. Okay, well you gotta turn the guy, give his money back then if he made a down payment. Uh, there's also frustration where somebody's caused the uh, subcontractor so much grief uh, no, this is not right, I want to change it, this, that, the other thing, uh, you know, just different issues that have come up. Uh, release of contract and accord and satisfaction. If there's a written statement signed by the parties that, yeah, this is all done, it's over, accord and satisfaction. That means, hey, this contract's paid, the work's done, everything's finished, so don't worry about it. Also, operation of law. Uh, if there's something that came, came up that said, well, no, this can't be done anyway according to the law, so then the, basically the contract is canceled. Uh, there are uh, breaches of contract. These can include material breaches. So in other words, man, this thing is completely wrong. Uh, minor breaches, hey, there's some few small things here I don't think are quite right, need to be fixed. Uh, timely performance, someone's got to get something done within a certain calendar time period, like a year, uh, and they don't get it done in a year, then they come back and say, well, yes, but the weather was worse than we expected, so we weren't be able to work inside. Uh, you know, just different things like that. Uh, there are remedies, <laughs> remedies. Contract remedies include damages. Uh, these can be compensatory. Uh, these are basically general damages that relate to uh, you know, something that would be normal, expected. Uh, consequential damages are where something new happens. Let's say somebody gets injured <clears throat> on something that was done for them in the form of a contract, uh, and then um, basically they have to have doctor bills paid as a result of something that happened. wasn't directly related, but it's, it springs out of the contract. Punitive damages where you're doing something that's so bad, uh, so terrible, that uh, you ought to be punished for it. Punity damages mean uh, punishment damages. Nominal damages uh, can be very small, like a dollar. Uh, liquidation, uh, you know, uh, can be, well, we're going to sell this off, see what it brings, and then the person that's been harmed it will obtain or get the outcome of the sale of the uh, liquidation. Uh, other damages, sale of goods. Uh, seller can have remedies including withholding delivery, stopping delivery, reselling goods, recover the difference, uh, cancel contract, recover the contract price, and that would sue the person for the contract, recover some type of ordinary damages, uh, cancel again, like I say, buyer's remedies, cancel, uh, cover, in other words, go out somewhere, get the goods that you are expecting, pay that other person, and say, okay, well, uh, you know, uh, this is all taken care of, but uh, you're not getting the rest of your money because you didn't deliver, I had to have somebody else deliver. Uh, you can require the person to turn over, where let's say it's a piece of artwork, uh, and the person was obligated to give it to you for X dollars. You paid the X dollars, they don't turn over uh, the Michelangelo painting. Uh, then that's where you can uh, try to recover the actual specific performance, which is give me that painting. I want that painting, not some other painting. Uh, there's also a possibility of damages for non delivery. Let's say you're planning on getting goods like fireworks. Here it's the 4th of July, so you're getting fireworks that you want to uh, set off uh, as a part of a celebration. Well, that's uh, important, okay? Got to be delivered in time for you to sell them to make a profit. Okay, well, moving on, sale of land. 
Uh, there can be construction of certain contracts there. There's always equity in contracts. Um, specific performance, I mentioned. Uh, rescission and restitution, someone paid, but the person can't deliver, so they deserve to get their money back. Uh, also, contracts can evolve into tort claims, where let's say someone's injured on the job or something. Uh, this can result in somebody having a lawsuit. So basically that's it on these terms. Hope you enjoyed this. I know it's a little bit dry. Tried to spice it up. I'm kind of at a disadvantage uh, being down here. I uh, hope to get me a, a whiteboard eventually and be able to uh, do presentations here uh, just like I do back in my classroom. Uh, but we'll work on that and uh, hope that you know you got something out of this. Main thing is to go over it. You can record this if you want to. Uh, listen to it again in the future. Uh, or you can do your own recording of your own rendering of definitions, vocabulary, things like that. So let me know if I can help you. Again, robdaywalt at me.com. Thanks. Bye.